Hi, this is John Snell I'm with the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, and I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce to you Cranion, which is a piece of software that we've been working on for a while to uh, help model and visualize some aspects of transcranial focused ultrasound treatment. So uh, what can you do with this? Well, as I said, uh, some, some aspects of the treatment can be modeled geometrically and visualized in an interactive way. There are also some tools uh, for doing patient selection tasks, uh, like computing the skull density ratio, and at least a first take on estimating very coarsely what the treatment envelope for a particular skull might be. Uh, you can output uh, various skull metrics uh, per channel of the array that you're using. And you can also, uh, at least at this time, coarsely estimate phase aberration, although that may not be useful for most people for the moment. So what do you need to run the software? Uh, hardware, uh, a reasonably recent uh, CPU, Core i5 or i7 are fine. Uh, in general, the application isn't very CPU bound, so it really you don't need a super fast CPU. Uh, the more RAM, the better. Uh, 16 gigabyte is a good starting place. Um, and most importantly, you need a, a fairly recent NVIDIA GPU, uh, one with at least 2 gigabyte of dedicated RAM, uh, and that will support OpenGL 4.5, so that is going to require reasonably recent hardware. Uh, what I'm using is a GTX 1080. Uh, which I believe has 12 gigabyte of VRAM. So again, the more RAM on board you have, uh, the more complex data sets you can deal with. Uh, and the, you know, the GPUs of this uh, vintage are, are going to be fast enough to uh, make the application really interactive. In terms of software platform, uh, Windows 8 or 10 are what I'm using and most tested, uh, other people have reported success running this on late kernels uh, of Linux. Uh, you need Java 1.8 or better uh, installed. It has to be the 64-bit version or you won't uh, have much luck. And either the JDK or the JRE uh, will work just fine. You can download those from the Oracle Java site for free. Uh, and also just make sure that you have the latest NVIDIA driver installed. Again, uh, you need support for OpenGL 4.5. So in order to install the software, you need to get it. And uh, I've put the URL to GitHub there where you can get the executable package. It's all zipped up there. Uh, once you've downloaded the cranion.zip file, you can unlit unzip it to uh, the location of your choice, doesn't matter, shouldn't matter. Uh, open up the resulting Cranion folder that's created and inside that you should find uh, cranion.exe for Windows. So if you have Windows, uh, just double click on that and the application should open. If you're on Linux uh, in a terminal window, you can uh, run the shell script that you'll also find there called run.sh in the same folder and again it, it should start up. Um, if you're interested in the source code we are releasing it uh, as open source under the MIT license and you can find the source code at, at the same GitHub site uh, as above. So let's go ahead and, and look at the software itself when you start it. It should look like this. Uh, and in the center of the screen is, is the transducer with uh, a kind of fictitious, generic-looking arrangement of elements, which are the blue dots uh, in this 30-centimeter diameter hemisphere. The way the UI is laid out is that there are a number of panels that slide out from the sides. Uh, you can hopefully appreciate them as these, these red bars. So if you hover your mouse over them, they'll pop out and you'll see uh, the various UI features here. So the main panel at the top is uh, where most of the things you need uh, will be found. Um, there are a number of tabs along the top that you can click through. Um, on the side uh, is a, a, a 
dialog slide out box for s selecting different sonications, uh, which mostly has to do with looking at treatment exports, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, something you will use is uh, the panel on the right, which has controls for um, brightness and contrast for CT and MR. And also, if you've got multiple MR series that you want to look at, usually, again, as part of a treatment export, uh, you can select through them here. So you have center for MR, you have center window, and also a threshold so that you can make low signal background uh, transparent. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, so generally, to control the 3D view with the mouse, the wheel will zoom in and out if you have a wheel on your mouse. Uh, there's a virtual trackball. So if you grab in the middle, uh, I can rotate around either axis by clicking in the middle and dragging. If I click out toward the sides and go up and down, then I'm rotating uh, around the direction coming out of the screen. And there's a little orientation widget in the bottom left if you get completely lost. So to make it a, uh, a little easier, let's import some CT data. So Usually when you're starting from scratch, you're going to need to import uh, a CT data set of the head so that you'll have the skull. Let's do that real quick. And what you need to do is to click on one DICOM file that's part of the series that you're interested in. So in this case, I've got a series in its own subdirectory. If you had more than one series worth of files in the subdirectory, it will work, but you'll have to know which images are part of which series for now. But what will happen is if I click on one of these, it will scan the whole directory and load only those slices that are part of the same series and it will orient them uh, in, the right in the right sequence and so forth. And so we're using volume rendering to display this. Uh, so again, I can rotate the scene around and what's happening now is that uh, this cut plane is running through where the current focus is, which now you can see on these, these right NPR panels. So the crosshair there is showing you where the natural focus of the transducer is. And when I rotate around the scene, it's keeping this cut plane aligned normal to my viewpoint, but always through this target point. If I want to slice out and see more of or all of the, the skull, I can go to the View tab, and there's a slider here called VR Slicing, which basically stands for Volume Rendering Slicing. If, if it's on zero, then this first cut plane is passing through the focal point. If I move it out, I will slice toward my eye farther until I've got the whole head being sliced. Um, there is a mode to cut away the transducer because obviously that's going to get in our way at some point if we want to see what's going on. So again, I can turn on this clipping function here and the transducer is clipped away. I'm going to turn it back off just for a second. If I zoom out here, this ring that you see around the outside represents the in inner surface of the bore of the MR. So this is a 60 centimeter uh, diameter ring. So just so you, you have a kind of a relation between where the transducer is and where the inside of the bore of the magnet would be. Turn the clipping back on. Down at the bottom is a histogram of the intensities of the CT data and it also serves as a way of, of picking uh, the opacity mapping of the volume rendering that you see. So if I if I move left and right, I'm, I'm basically moving the opacity threshold uh, in this transfer function back and forth, and you can do that in real time. Uh, obviously, in this data set, as in most data sets like this, you'll, you'll have this pesky head holder uh, show up, which uh, you may not want. And so there's, if you go down to your imaging tab, and pick the CT tab. There's a filter CT button. It also appears in the file tab. It does the same function, but if I pick that, um, an operation is done to morphologically remove 
the headrest so it's just out of the way. It doesn't uh, modify any of the other CT data. All right, so uh, normally you, you would like to see the MR for appreciating target, so I'm going to now go to the import DICOM MR function. And the same thing, I'm going to pick a DICOM file that's part of a series. Uh, so now you can see both the CT and the MR is loaded. If I slice the 3D view back to the focal point, Again, it's, it's this first slice that we see is the one that's aligned with the target point. These two data sets obviously are not registered, which we would probably like them to be. Um, so we have uh, a simple um, mutual information based registration mechanism. So if you click that button, the light will come on while it's actively registering, and these things will come into registration. It may take uh, more than one cycle of that uh, to, to get the best registration. Um, and the, this light should go out when it's done. But you can also you know, freely still move around the scene while the registration is going on. OK, and it's done now. So again, you could run that a couple times and, and get this probably a little bit closer, but we'll, we'll keep moving on. Um, so to say a little bit about these images on the right, um, I can make them bigger by clicking the little green button in the bottom left if you want to zoom in on one of these things. If I click in the window and drag, uh, it updates where the natural focus of the array is aimed in the head and, and the other two views stay synchronized with that. Uh, if I want to move out of plane, I can use the wheel of the mouse to move uh, in tenth of a millimeter increments. If you want to go faster, hold the shift key down and you can you can move it in one millimeter increments. And again, you can you know change your center window for CT and MR uh, with this pullout panel. And just so you can see what happens, the MR threshold, if I put it to zero, then you know, I get sort of an opaque black background, um, which is useful to kind of carve that away so you can adjust your threshold accordingly. If you want to, uh, you can also turn on a model of the stereotactic frame. This is kind of a generic frame just to kind of give you an idea. Uh, again, you, you may have to move it to a more plausible place. I'm going to go ahead and slice all the way out. Oh, I should say it's pretty useful if you if you right click on any of these NPR views, the 3D view will align with the, the same orientation. So I'm going to go here and say translate frame. And now if I drag in the window here, I will apply the same translation to the frame that, and I can go to different orientations to move this in those directions. Anyway, so I um, just have to always remember to put this back so that you can move things around without having the frame flow around. So uh, just to give you an idea of um, maybe some situations where you might have to worry about where the frame is. So if I move the target point toward the posterior, uh, you can see part of the frame turns red and that's where it would actually strike the inside of the transducers just as a warning that you, you know, for targets like that, you, you do need to worry about uh, the frame posts and pins. So I'm gonna turn the frame back off again. We'll put this back to the middle. So the the uh, the main functionality here for kind of understanding, you know, how the system is going to interact with the geometry of the scroll is to to turn on this ray tracer. And what is happening now is that a ray is being traced from every element in the array to the natural focus 
and figuring out what parts of the skull are intercepted along the way. So right now we're seeing colored dots on the, the surface of the skull representing all the strike points of all the elements on the outside of the skull, and they're color-coded by their incident angle, uh, where red is basically anything over the critical angle where total reflection would happen. And down on the bottom left, we're seeing of the 1024 elements, how many are uh, still uh, effective in terms of their incident angle. And a, and a histogram of all the angles of the 1,024 elements. For each of the rays, we calculate an SDR, skull density ratio. Uh, and this number and the bar on the top represents the, the average over all the active elements, excuse me, and um, a histogram below of the distribution of the SDR values. Uh, just to give you kind of a, a a little bit better understanding of, of how the SDR works. If I right click on one of these channels, it turns blue. And if I go to the transducer tab now, it gives me some information about that channel, its number in the array. Uh, the SDR, either just with a single ray trace or with a 5x5 five five average, uh, the incident angle. The path length through the skull with refraction, if you have refraction turned on, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then the skull thickness computed as sort of uh, just the normal thickness from the surface straight through, but not along the refracted path necessarily. And this graph is, is showing a line plot of the, the Hounsfield unit profile along that ray. So you can see where we go uh, into the skull well, actually, into the soft tissue, this first peak is the outer surface of the skull, and the second peak is the inner surface of the skull. And the SDR is calculated as the ratio of this low point and the outside high point in terms of Hounsfield units. Uh, on this tab, we can do things uh, like update uh, the cortical bone speed that we, we would use for calculating the refraction. You can sort of see some of the colors changing there. I'll show you another mode that makes that more apparent. Um, the average bone speed, again, is a, is a fixed uh, bone speed for that's used over the whole skull right now for all elements when calculating phase. And we can also tilt the transducer, which is something clinically that's pretty often done. So you know, we can tilt this back and forth. So we'll, we'll leave it at probably about eight degrees for now. Um, there is a way uh, in that Cranion folder that you have when you install, there's a transducer subfolder in which you can put INI files from your own system if you have an Insight Tech system. Uh, and if you have more than uh, one of these, you'll get a list that you can pick from to choose different transducers. Again, the default is kind of this fictitious generic one. So let's slice into this head back to the focal point. When we do that, the rendering mode changes now to actually show us uh, the various rays that have been traced, in this case, including refraction on the outside and the inside of the skull. I'll use my MPR views to orient me. And if, as I move the target around, those rays get recomputed in real time along with their angles. Um, so you can see the colors change and, and the elements turning off or be, uh, rather becoming uh, ineffective as, as we move toward the bone. And you can watch this color bar on the bottom left change as I move left to right. So in the center, nearly all the elements are on as I move laterally. Uh, I, st I start to lose the majority of my elements. N now that I have... Uh, my registration done and so forth. I might like to save this so I don't have to reload. You know, I don't have to go through that importation process again. So I can go to save, which will save a, a native Cranion file. So I'll call it test. And later I can now just bring this whole scene back by choosing open and um, if I can find that file now. So I can just pick this 
file again to, to reopen the scene and go back to where I, I was without having to re-import DICOM data and do the registration and all of that. Uh, yeah, if I want to save that target point, I can put a target. You'll see that I have the RAS coordinate is here. And I can add it. And now it's on this list. So if, if I move my target around and I want to go back, I can go to this list and select it. It will take me back to the target that I saved. Another useful thing for, for some of you perhaps would be to, to replay a treatment export. If you have uh, export files from clinical treatments that you've done um, on the Insight Tech system, you can choose this load treatment export. And normally you'll get a treatment export as a one big zip file, and we don't support reading that in its zipped form just yet. I think probably in the future we will. So you'll need to unzip that first. And when you do that, you'll you'll have a top level folder with whatever that zip file was called. So just cho choose the top level folder of your treatment export, which will have a big directory of files underneath it now, and say open. You'll get an error if for some reason it doesn't recognize it. So now I'm loading that treatment export. Uh, so again, it, it should all, it should come all registered. I'm going to turn the clipping back on. Uh, and now normally you'll, you'll have uh, some collection of live and pre-op MR. I'm going to go to a, a pre-op axial image. And I guess I need to adjust my threshold a little bit. Something like that. And if you look in the sonication panel now, and I'm going to make this stay open. In this list, I have all the sonications that were part of that treatment that I can select through. Uh, I can turn on if uh, each of these should have thermometry associated with it. And you'll see typically they progress in power in a normal treatment. So we'll pick one of the later ones that has a little bit more heating associated. So we can see a color wash of the thermometry over the MR, as well as uh, in this graph now the, uh, the temperature plot at, at that spot, at the targeted spot, uh, with a maximum value at the, the center and then a, a three by three neighborhood around it. And by default this will come up at displaying the hottest point, but you can also scrub if you drag your left mouse through this graph, you can play back the time series of the thermometry. And again you can switch to other sonications and it's because of, there's only 2D thermometry uh, in these cases it's automatically flipping the orientation of the data set so that the MR thermometry plane is normal to your viewing direction. I can spin these, but it gets a little bit confusing because the thermometry plane is no longer aligned with my viewpoint. So just re-click it and we'll take you back. And, and even in you know in these cases of playing back um, the treatment export, you, you can still turn the ray tracer on and, and uh, get an idea of uh, the geometry of, of the rays and the skull and so forth. It works the same as, as before. Uh, so one of the things you can do now with the data set loaded um, is to save a, f a text file with save skull parameters and it's opened, saved the file and opened it in Notepad. And, and so it's, it's a fairly rudimentary list of things for now. This will probably expand over time. Uh, channel number, SDR, average area, SDR, incident angle, skull thickness, refracted skull path length. And uh, we're not using this anywhere yet, but just one 
estimation of the speed of sound, average speed of sound in the skull, uh, based on the, hound, the average hound's field units uh, on the beam path through the skull. You can also um, save a phase correction file based on this geometry, um, which has the, the for each channel the phase and radians and an amplitude which is always one unless the channel is deactivated because its incident, incidence angle is too high, in which case it'll be zero. There's probably some examples here, yeah. Again, not, not so useful for most people right now. Uh, we've used this in doing some hydrophone studies where this file can actually be loaded into the Cytex system and, and used to play back that uh, phase correction. So we can also, for, for uh, all the loaded sonications here, select the Show Targets button, which will then um, show as colored spheres the, the different targets. I'll turn the ray tracing off for a second so we can see a little better. So th this is uh, you know, all of the locations for this whole list right now um, which is you know includes both physical motion of the transducer as well as any phase steering that's been applied but the, those are all the actual cloud of locations if you will that were defined by all these sonications um, turn them off and turn off the MR and I, I don't have a separate button for that now it's the H key on the keyboard if I turn the slicing all the way up you know, again in some of these clinical cases you don't have data for the whole skull just for the calvarium um, and that's sort of uh, what it looks like so here's a, another data set that I've loaded uh, and I've just manually added sonications for most of the common targets. So we're, we're just at the VIM now. I just wanted to go back and say a little bit more about refraction and so on. Uh, stay with the generic transducer. So if we change this cortical bone speed uh, down to the speed of water, uh, then essentially no refraction occurs and you get just these straight razor straight paths through the skull, you know, no matter where you aim. Um, if you turn that speed up, instead of a sharp focus, you get kind of a fuzzy focus as, you, as the speed increases and the refraction angle increases accordingly. So in you know, reality is somewhere around up here, depending on the skull. Um, and again, if we slice out to look at the surface, you can see the, the colored dots and uh, the same thing. So if we go to the cortical bone speed and set it to water, everything is green. And as we increase it more and more, things turn red. And if, as we move the focus toward the bone, you can watch different parts of the array essentially become ineffective because of the extreme incident angles that are that are caused um, you know, particularly in these lateral targets one thing that may be useful is that depending on you know how close to reality you, you set your cortical bone speed we can calculate a kind of 3D map of how many elements will be on in a 3D region in the middle of the head. It takes a little while, so I'm going to push the button. So what's going on now is this ray tracing operation is being done across a 3D volume. Uh, I think in this case a 21 by 21 by 21 array of points um, centered on the middle of the head. Uh, hopefully big enough to, to give us an idea and it will display as a color map 
on the MR of how many elements are effective in that region of the brain. Uh, green will be 700 and more, yellow will be 700 or less, and red will be 500 or less. And again, it, it's dependent on the shape of the skull and also the, the cortical bone speed that you, you pick. So uh, you can see the map over here on the left. Let's slice back out so we can see that and turn the ray tracer off. So here's this color map now. So everything, any target I put in green will have at least 700 elements effective. Yellow, less than 700. Red, less than 500. But this gives you kind of a, an idea. So you can, if you look at the, all the clinical targets I've defined, you know, they, they are all in this green zone. Uh, the GPI targets start to get pretty close laterally to the edge of, uh, of the green here. But uh, all the, the clinical targets that people are investigating today are obviously uh, inside of that, that region. But the, the sort of unique shape of these contours has everything to do with the, the curvature of this particular skull. So you can um, calculate this on a per skull basis. And generally, if you pick a higher cortical bone speed, meaning the refraction angles are going to be bigger, the, the green area will get smaller. If you pick a lower value, it will get bigger. So um, it ultimately, any sort of predictive power of this is, is kind of pursuant to picking a realistic uh, bone speed for the refraction at the surfaces of the skull. Well, I think that, that uh, I've taken you through most of the functionality of Cranion. I hope uh, it's interesting. Again, if you go back to the beginning of the video, and there'll be links down below um, of how to get both the source code and the executable. Watch this space. We plan to be adding more functionality to this over time and, and actually welcome others to, to make contributions to it as well. So thanks for your attention. Uh, more to follow later.